Welcome to the Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to the Table. We discuss issues of God and culture. I'm Daryl Bach, Executive Director for Cultural Engagement at the Hendricks Center at Dallas Theological Seminary. And my guest today is David Ridley, founder of Invesco Real Estate and uh, Transitioning, which is a <laughs> euphemism, I guess, for for uh, what we sometimes call retirement. But he's busy, so he <laughs> he just want he wants you to know he's not kicking back on a couch somewhere, not doing much of anything. Uh, and we're here to discuss faith and work, and particularly um, looking at it from the standpoint of a business person who hoped for help from the church at one time. Uh, didn't receive it, but now is seeing a transition in the way the church walks into the faith and work space and is encouraging that, and it's also engaged himself in trying to communicate with corporations about the nature of, of, of corporate culture in ways that uh, reflect both um, what's healthy for the company, but also has a good element of uh, Christian values attached to it. How's that for a summary of? Oh, man, that's it? good. <laughs> I could have done that good, good myself. <laughs> okay, so, or you know, we're we're learning as we go here. Mm. Um, so let's talk a little bit about about your experience. The first question I ask almost every guest on the on the podcast is, so how did you get into this gig? I mean, what what what? Um, how did, how did you get to where you are now? Tell us a little bit of the story of, of your interest in the area of faith and work. Well, that's interesting. It was for sure a God deal. Mm-hmm. And I know that sounds clicheish, but in my case, it was a God deal. You know? It was because uh, as founder of this other company in 1983, Invesco Real Estate, we, did, we were blessed and did extremely well. And so when retirement came, <clears throat> they'd asked me not to leave, but to hang around for a couple years and do some coaching around what made us successful in our group, which was a a smaller part of the larger Invesco organization. And so it forced me to uh, write a curriculum. So I tried to write this curriculum, and about a month into it, I threw it all in the trash, and God had said to me, you just write what we did. Mm -hmm. So that's what came out. Mm -hmm. And it became a program at Invesco called DICE. They still use it heavily. And uh, so as I pulled away from the business altogether, it dawned on me all these college talks I'd been asked to make around this topic could they, it just address this faith and work topic so perfectly. Hmm. The problem was I'd never heard of the faith and work <laughs> <laughs> movement topic yeah. or movement, and so you're teaching me about that now, and it's just been such a rich experience to see where some of this is applicable to. So that. you're a Christian who's really rolled the dice at one time in your life, huh? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was a bit of an entrepreneur, and, and uh, that's why I look like this today. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, you never had a job past you know your, your last day, and mm-hmm. <clears throat> it came to succeeding or failing. And I always thought, well, if I fail, I'll fall forward. I'm young enough; I'll go get a bank teller job and start over. You know? mm-hmm. And, and, you, and uh, talk about the early days of, of what, what kind of created the transition from, you know, just trying to get something off the ground and get it launched to, to really um, launching you in this kind of a direction. Because you really, as we talked about, we've met with the students earlier, um, as you've talked about, um, you, you initially looked for help from the church and there wasn't anything. You were on your own. So, um, so talk, about, talk about how you kind of stepped into this area more formally and, and what you did with your company that changed its direction. What happened was <clears throat> I would mentioned in, um, today earlier uh, in the chapel that I had uh, asked a, uh, an older gentleman in our church, and I obviously won't name churches, mm-hmm. but I'd asked him if he'd consider mentoring me. That was way before mentoring <clears throat> was in style, and he looked at me and he just laughed. He says, "Why in the world would I do that?" Mm-hmm. And I, I was humiliated, mm-hmm. and I walked away. And truthfully, I never thought too much about asking the church for any further help in mm-hmm. my career because I didn't know that was possible. Mm-hmm. In fact, I saw this divide, and and almost felt it was made to feel a little bit guilty if I spent too much time at work. So. Mm-hmm. I didn't know you were supposed to maybe get help from work in, in thinking about your career and those things. So. Hmm. And then uh, uh, talk about the time when you changed – when, when the, your approach to actually handling your company changed direction as well. Well, I was uh, 
uh, uh, it's funny. God has such an amazing way as you look back on it. But I, I had a vision around uh, – I heard a man talk about the future of our business, which is basically funds management. Uh, okay, so we manage money for large pension funds, endowments, foundations, et cetera, sovereign wealth funds around the world. And I heard this gentleman talk about that vision, and God kind of gave that vision to me to do it. And as he would only do, I, next thing you know, I was um, I met a gentleman, and I went to work doing just that from, from nothing. And so that, that took off, and in, in I was learning along the way and really had no idea what I was doing. Uh, if I had been smarter, I would have never tried it, but I launched. That was 1983. And by 1985, uh, we had one client, which, by the way, we had for 10 years, just one client. That's a learning experience and a book in its own, right? Mm-hmm. But, but so I'm, uh, I'm in Houston, and I asked this gentleman. He was a major real estate broker in Houston that we look to to supply our uh, investors with product. And, and he looked at me at a table that night with his staff around him, and he says, Dave, do you have any idea that – you're not going to make it in this business. You're two years in. You're not going to make it. Who are you going to? Who are you to compete with, J.P. Morgan or Goldman Sachs? And, mm-hmm. and the bad news was, I realized he was right. And who was I? Uh, it was a ridiculous thought. So I walked back to my hotel room that night, and I remember sitting at this little desk, this little hotel room in the Galleria, and taking a sheet of paper and writing all the way down to the bottom my fears and trepidations and weaknesses, why I couldn't do this with the intent of just giving out to Jesus. I just gave it to God and basically asked him to take me out of this, lead me somewhere else, or if he would just become chairman. And that's what I said and got on my knees in that hotel room and he became chairman and I was willing to not work there or go somewhere else, whatever. And What I distinctly remember was walking through the halls the next day in Dallas, Brian Tower, and thinking, wow, I feel great. Uh, The pressure was gone. Hmm. The heartburn was gone. I had a very powerful boss. I wasn't worrying about disappointing him anymore. That's how I knew it was gone. He was Mm -hmm. a very, very powerful man in in Dallas and politics in general. And so creativity returned. And I, I became creative again and happy. And actually, the way he started demonstrating in a positive way, in a, in a more um, material way, was he started bringing me my partners that I retired from my business here two years ago. They're still there. Hmm. I couldn't affect great hires, but he did. And I never lost one of those partners or a client during that period of time. That's a mir- that's a miracle. So this is 25 to 30 years that you worked together side yeah. by side? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 You know, they're still there. In fact, I just spoke at one of the other guy's retirement the other day hmm. back, back at the office. His transition? His transition, <laughs> yes. Sorry, sorry, Dave. <laughs> well, maybe he did retire. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. So, so um, and, and what you really have come to major in, it's what we want to spend our time talking about, is the development of a kind of corporate culture and the way in which the formation of the workplace really um, can model and reflect values that we also see in the church and, and, and the kind of the cross learning that's taken place, but with one other awareness before we go there, and that is that now you're sensing that there is more help available in the church for, for business people and the possibilities of how business people and, and pastoral staffs can connect is, is growing in what you're seeing, and in fact, you're experiencing that yourself. As God taught me what it meant to love people in the workplace, which is another story, he he honestly uh, taught me that there was a way to move forward and love people and and show uh, ministers in the church how they can get involved in that. Mm -hmm. And what I've seen is I'm being asked to speak at a, a lot of colleges now, but other organizations that the church needs this is much or more than the business community. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's this great gap there in most churches. There is something going on here. That's been amazing for me to see, but there is still a gap that we need to close mm-hmm. and look at this as the workplace as, if you will, the extended church. Mm-hmm. It's a huge mission field there. So there are things that I didn't realize at the time I was learning, but I was learning how to really love people, which is obviously what the church is about. Mm-hmm. But in the marketplace. So, so in, when you, when we talk about kind of what made your company work, and and just to complete the loop on the story, 
Um, this guy told you that you'd never be a success in doing what you were doing, but um, you did manage to stay there for a long time uh, and so over several years and with many partners. So it's clear that this change that you brought to the company with this handing it over to God um, actually did bring change to your company as well. Talk about that. Absolutely. Uh, I would not have made it if that night had not happened in that Houston hotel room. There's no way. Um, that changed everything. That was a game changer. So what, that, what happened there was it gave me the confidence to realize that I was competing against forces outside – that's called capitalism mm – -hmm. not inside, and I had to start creating a very healthy environment within my firm to compete with that if I hope to succeed. So the first hire I made after that was a, a great gentleman – I won't use his name – but I paid him literally exactly to the penny, twice as much as I was making. Hmm. This other guy just spoke at his retirement. He came in making 20000 more than me. And my boss thought I was crazy, but I knew the competition was there, and I also knew that Jesus was CEO, and so I felt zero threat by that. Hmm. My goal then became to surround myself with the most talented, good-hearted people that I could so we could compete, and so that – so we're, so when you talk about healthy environment, you're talking about a relationally healthy environment that people work in. Yeah, uh, it's relationally healthy, but, but corporate health is something that's starting to get a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. When we were doing it, I had no idea what it was called. Mm -hmm. I didn't learn this till later. But it was around very uh, a healthy platform that made people want to be a part of it. It's mm -hmm. like that family feel. Mm -hmm. My first stab at it was studying Southwest Airlines. What was it that made those guys different that people wanted to be there? Mm -hmm. Herb Kelleher, you know, it was about love. Mm -hmm. and, and so I started learning slowly from them, seeing something I'd never seen before. So it started off, uh, we looked for people who basically loved to work together and loved to work in teams, and that could be humble um, and be vulnerable. And literally, we found we could IQ compound in those teams. And I realized that I had to be the inspirational leader to carry that torch, and it had to be authentic. And so those are some of the things. Other health factors are, are like being able to um, share knowledge with, with no hesitation. Mm -hmm. Don't hide anything. I've seen some really negative environments before where that's not the case, and there are several other factors there. So when you talk about IQ compound, you're really talking about team building in a healthy kind of way where everyone participates. They each bring strengths. They round out the team, if you want to think about those that kind of language. That's what's going on? Yeah. Everybody has different gifts. We're all broken, mm -hmm. and we're all different. Mm -hmm. The diversity makes the team great. Mm -hmm. It's what made America great, if mm -hmm. you think about it. So we come in there, and uh, we, we have, A, no egos allowed posted on the door, mm -hmm. an obligation to dissent. Mm -hmm. The only bad meeting is a quiet meeting mm -hmm. where one person's doing all the talking. Mm -hmm. And it's always up to the leader to be vulnerable and to be open and not worry about look, being, uh, looking stupid and to get it all out there. Mm -hmm. And that sets the rules for the room and for the entire organization. Mm -hmm. Then we get smart. That's IQ compounding. That's how you compete with major stalwarts mm -hmm. in, the, in the industry mm -hmm. is, is binding together like that. By the way, and God made us to be together. Mm -hmm. I've yeah, learned that. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, we've, we've – talked about this before, of course, the roots of this in Genesis 1 and 2 and the way in which God has made people in His image. He's a creator. He's a sustainer. So there's creativity. There's sustaining ability. There's management ability. The importance of stewardship is a theological concept. Mm -hmm. Coming out of the early chapters of Genesis, we've been called to steward the world and to steward it well. You look around and you go, well, maybe we're not doing always all that yeah. great sometimes. But, but that, that's the calling of what people are. When people steward well, when they reflect the way God has made them, there's satisfaction in that. There's flourishing in that. There, it, it produces a good product. And I take it that part of what you're talking about is the ability to take that into the workplace and make that the environment in which people work. Yes, it is. And the way you can do that is by being real and, as I said, authentic. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> We're all broken. Uh, during staff meetings, I'd always have folks raise their hands and say, who's, who's broken? You know, I'd be mm -hmm. the first guy with my hand up. We need each other mm -hmm. to win this. We need to love each other, and I'd say we need to forgive each other because we're all broken. And, 
And I'll tell you one thing: I'm I'm one of the guys that needed the most forgiving mm-hmm. because you got you've got to have a fire in your stomach. Uh, this is the most com- a competitive world that's ever existed with the information flow and talent and the educations that are out there. Lots of smart people. You have to stick together to make this happen. So, so what are you doing now? I mean, we've talked kind of about where, where you, what you came out of. What, what do people? What do you? You, we've said you've transitioned. You've transitioned into what? That's a good question. I'm trying to figure that out a little bit, but um, it's funny. But God put me in touch with another ministry that asked me to speak on college campuses. So I've done that from Stanford over to the East Coast at Georgetown and Nebraska to UT, where I graduated hmm. from, and. SMU a lot, and so I'm learning how to take that material, which is really meant for tutoring and coaching a for-profit organization. I love mentoring young guys, and it all came together. This is what I want to do. So it's been speaking to a lot of universities. I've had a few businesses ask me to come in. I've got uh, several organizations uh, that are asking me to come and, and do this talk. So it seems like that's where God's taken me. Then you come along and teach me about faith and work and really what that means. And and uh, I do have a, a strong vision around getting that into the uh, the marketplace. Hmm. So I don't know how that looks or what it looks like. But so when these schools ask you, are you are you teaching into business classes? Are they undergraduate classes? Are they MBA classes? What are the whole range? What's what's kind what's of that the whole like? range? But my favorite uh, audiences are MBAs. Mm-hmm. Love that. I've done the whole kit and caboodle where you've had undergraduates and MBAs together. Had 500 people up in Nebraska, and I could see mm-hmm. some of the uh, maybe education majors swing in their chair like they're going to go to sleep on me. So <laughs> <laughs> it's happened more than once in my life. Yeah. So um, you know, some some folks may not relate to it as well, but but almost all the time, uh, it's a very rich environment when I'm in MBA classes and in businesses where they they know this and need it. You know. So um, so they they ask you, do you, does your talk have a? T- I haven't asked you this. Does your talk have a title? Yeah, uh, it depends on which group. Sometimes I modify it. If it's a Christian group, it's simple, mm-hmm. which I've done. The secular classes, which I'm looking at some more right now, it's a little more complicated. But it's called building, winning, uh, building enduring organizations, hmm. winning without regrets. Hmm. That's what it is. And there's always a God topic in it, mm-hmm. but it'll be a little more subdued in the secular mm-hmm. classes. So, so let, let, the, this difference fascinates me a little bit. Uh, so, let's talk about first the Christian version. What when you when you're talking to Christians, what what are you what are you telling them? Uh, I'm certainly no theologian like you, Doctor Bach, but I'll get into why are we doing this? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> first, I start off with my story, and I I, I love to to open it up by saying, uh, "Hey, who likes to lose in here? Come mm-hmm. on, be on, be really honest with me. Mm-hmm. Raise your hand if you like to lose, mm-hmm. because we're going to form the Losers Club. <laughs> it's, it's, Losers, it's, it's not so rewarding. anonymous, huh? It's very rewarding. <laughs> yeah. But no, then I, I we laugh and I say we we've been built to win. We want to win. We want to uh, glorify God through our winning. So I'll talk about that and then get into how hard that is. Uh, eight out of ten businesses are, are not here in 18 months, new hmm. startups. Hmm. 96% are gone in 10 years. Hmm. This is tough, and mm-hmm. it's very messy. So I talk about, uh, within that talk, why, you know, the, the intrinsic value of work, and there's three things I'll talk about, and uh, then I'll get into some of the tactics that have helped us win, hmm. what worked for us. May not work for you, but it sure worked for us. And then I get into the building a healthy platform, and I show them what that looks like. You know how you put execution, operations, and client engagement on that platform, and why it works. And it works because it builds stability. And when you're with each other for a long time, even idiots like me can get it right. You know, mm-hmm. and so it's a real competitive advantage. And then we'll talk about the attributes about it being built around people. And, and the two qualities we always looked for was, was humility and team ethos. Hmm. Then it gets into how to make decisions, how to win, you hmm. know, how to win. And mm-hmm. that's, people really like that, and that glorifies God. Hmm. So that's the Christian. 
The non Christian is very similar. I'll tell them about the hotel room experience. I told that story all over in Vesco. Mm-hmm. I'd use the God word all mm-hmm. over. They couldn't fire me at that moment because <laughs> I was retired anyway, or sort of. <laughs> and plus, it is a part of the story. <laughs> yeah, and it, 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 I couldn't couldn't tell a story without it. I, yeah, I'd be afraid I'd uh, dishonor God tremendously. So, so that story got told all over in Vesco. Uh, obviously, a very secular audience, but it was my platform, my personal platform. Then I'll talk about the business platform, because you can't talk about engaging clients without that platform, Mm -hmm. because clients know who you are. Mm -hmm. They know everything about you within a year Hmm. in our business. So the platform has to be authentic. So, 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 and and by platform, I've got to decode you here a little bit. (laughs) Um, By platform, you mean the kind of business that you are, the way you run, what the kind of services you provide, the way you provide them. Is that is that what you mean? What do you mean by platform? Personal platform. I mean worldview. What is it that gives me purpose and meaning? Okay. And for the business platform, kind of the same thing. It's that healthy environment that make people want to be there. Okay. It's not the paychecks. Okay. It, in fact, paychecks are two or three down. And it's, in I'm hearing it's not even the product in some ways. Not the product. Okay. And I didn't care if we were investing in real estate or building basketballs. Uh-huh. The bottom line was it's not the product. It's wanting to be with an organization that loves you and you love them, and it's like a family. That, in in my opinion, is the, the ultimate goal. So it's a search for connection rather than just the provision of a commodity. That's a great way to put it. Yeah. Um, uh that's interesting. That opens up all kinds of questions. We'll probably come back to on the other side of the break. Um, so, um, so you, so the 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 challenge of the secular side of this, I take, is the you're you're talking in one sense about Christian values, but you're trying to be sensitive to the fact that not everyone will identify with the Christian faith of what's going on. So you've got to be able to talk about it just in in I could say this in raw productivity terms or in raw human terms. Yes, um, all the the components of companies' health. Are really embedded in Christian, uh, Christian ethos, right? Mm-hmm. So it's very easy to talk about those things without being overtly Christ-centered. You can talk about what good looks like. So that's that's really pretty simple uh, to make that transition uh, with Christian audiences. You're allowed to really go there. Okay, yeah. so it's a, it's it's a, there's a line that I use a lot when I speak in public about cultural engagement. It goes something like this. You know, Christians are used to being able to say it's true because it's in the Bible, mm. but we have to learn how to tell people that it's in the Bible because it's true. Mm. And so, so what you're doing on the secular side is you're telling people this works because it's true. It's a way of, of, of communities – it's a way of making functional communities work and be effective. Um, whereas in the, in the biblical context, we can say, well, the Bible has these values. So you've negotiated that space very effectively in the context of business. Uh, this is a question I haven't asked you. Uh, let, me, let me start here. You know, a lot of people wrestle with the use of resources in life, you know, and, and since you manage money, you obviously see the product of what that is. Talk a little bit as a businessman about how, let's, let's say the average Christian, you know, yeah, I get a check and I know I'm part of an economy, but I don't get what and I have this kind of mixed feeling about how how money works. You know, um, uh, tell me what I should think about that as a as a person and, and as a Christian. How should, what should be my how how attached should I be to the material aspects of life? It's a okay. it's a deep, profound question. I know, but I'm but I figure if you've managed money most of your life, you've probably thought about that to some degree in terms of what what you try and help people do with what it is that you're managing. Well, Howard Hughes gave us that answer. Mm-hmm. He said, "How much is enough? Mm-hmm. Just a little more." <laughs> <laughs> and I've learned that the hard way. Uh-huh. I think a lot of business folks and others learn that the hard mm-hmm. way. It's never enough. Mm-hmm. So it's it, as a uh, you know the founder of the business and CEO. It's hard for me to get up and talk about money, and it shouldn't be your number one driver in life when you have plenty and maybe a an admin doesn't have as much. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so it is a very um, uh, tricky topic sometimes. Absolutely. 
But basically, we talk so much about uh, the values in what – it's our value proposition, really, what our purpose is, why we're there, the meaning that gives us, and that God has us in, a, in our path where we should be running. Mm-hmm. And I don't care if it's uh, you know being a mechanic or if it's doing something in finance, that's the lane he has us on. And so to just be very happy about that and feel your worth – in that area. And uh, the money situation, of course, we don't get into many topics on money, but we right. emphasize it's not about the money here. It's about winning and being together as a family. Mm-hmm. And that's how we, we would approach it. And I, and I take it that winning is being defined in a, in a particular way. Uh, it isn't a crushing of the competition or something like that, but it, it's, it's being useful and, and serving well with the resources that God has given you so that you don't hold them kind of like this, and this is mine, but you think about what can I do creatively with the, with the resources that God has given me that, 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 at least when we're thinking about this in most Christian terms, that allows me to, to impact um, people in a, in a positive way. Is, would that be what you're talking about, or is winning more complex than that? Well, in, again, in the business world, it is about winning. Mm-hmm. Uh, in our field, and I'm sure it's this way in most, there may be 100 firms vying for the state of California's pension fund. Mm-hmm. It'll get down to 20, and then it'll get down to the finals presentation, which is four of us. Mm-hmm. That's very difficult not to get focused, because if you don't win at all, you're out looking for another job. So a lot of it truly is about winning. So that's the pressure That's the pressure of the job. Very, very pressured. Uh, we didn't land a new client for over 10 years. Mm-hmm. We had one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what God – I think God uses your job as a chisel mm-hmm. to form us into who we are. Mm-hmm. He created money. He created work. He values that. So the best way I know is you said don't hold on too tight. Mm-hmm. If your self-worth is driven by the money you make and the successes you have, you can really get smashed. You can get crazy. Because it's up and down. It's up and down. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you know, We won more than our share, and we were so blessed, but we lost a lot. And most of us in business, you can survey this. Most executives will tell you that I learned far more from the defeats and losses than I ever did the wins. Hmm. In my case, that was absolutely true. Mm-hmm. We did a postmortem after every loss we had and uh, never forgot the losses. So basically, we try to steer people towards loving the pursuit of it and, and loving the fellowship and the healthy environment we're building as sort of the family-like environment, and the wins will come. So uh, the pursuit of a common goal that's worth achieving is part of what it, we're talking about? Creating a vision for folks and repeating it over and over. It's about robust communication in the mm-hmm. workplace. Mm-hmm. A, it's got to be authentic, mm-hmm. and then it's got to be communicated a lot. Mm-hmm. Then that gives people ownership in it. And those are health factors. Mm-hmm. Now, robust communication, this is a phrase that I love because I think it's really, really important. And that's the ability to have a meeting where everybody steps forward with what they really think and it can express themselves in ways that build towards a, a corporate assent to what is happening and does so in a way in which the disagreements that take place don't end up having – or don't become viewed as having a personal edge to them. They're all in line with uh, the attempt by the group to, to take a step together in a direction. Is that fair? Yes. And that takes building trust, Mm -hmm. and that's got to be modeled from the top. Mm -hmm. And if it's not modeled effectively from the top, it becomes political, and then it shuts it down. Mm -hmm. And then you don't have IQ compounding going on. You have just the opposite. You have everybody fending for themselves, and you don't have a team. I've seen it up close and personal. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was asked to go consult with a billionaire whose business was was starting to really wane. Uh, He was getting up in age. And I won't name names, obviously, but I went to New York, spent a week up there and a lot more time. But I called it the wagon wheel approach. You had him sitting in the middle in the spokes were all his employees trying to get in his office and see him when he wasn't on TV. Mm -hmm. Then they'd get the information and they'd run back to their office and close the door. Mm -hmm. And, and, And I remember him pointing his finger at me when we were talking about changes he had to make and him saying, by golly, don't you take me off TV. Mm hmm. So that's the last thing we want to do. Mm-hmm. What we want to do is get some management in here and let you be the, the uh, 
uh, the city, you know, the chairman mm-hmm. move you up in rank and let you do what you do best. But we have to have someone building the right platform here, hmm. the right values. So that's – I was so glad I had that opportunity because it showed me the opposite of what good looks like, sort of the textbook, what bad can look like. Mm-hmm. So that was a dying organization until that happened, and the jury's still out. So so this, this was someone who was so – Controlling and everything that was go- going through the funnel of him, that uh, that he actually his workforce <laughs> wasn't producing much force for their work because they were they were being funneled by the way he was handling things. It's a horrible situation. Hmm. Yeah, and you'd know him. It's hmm. um, it's the star system versus the right. team approach. Right. And there are there's no right or wrong answer. There are great companies that have stars, mm-hmm. and especially like in the brokerage business or mm-hmm. something. But in complex businesses, um, the team approach works, and that's what we ascribe to. Interesting. Yeah. So, um, so let's let's talk about the church side of this a little bit. Um, I, I, you know, I listen to this, and we've talked about this that for a lot of churches, the nine to five slice of of the day is the least directly addressed part of of discipleship and teaching that happens. You know, you'll talk about your family, you'll talk about your community, you'll certainly talk about church ministry, you might talk about the political and social situation or the situation in your schools or or, thing, or things that are going on with different organizations and different ethical areas. But the one space that doesn't tend to get talked about is the nine to five space, this space that you've just taken us through in which people are feeling terrific pressure their life and livelihood and their care of their family sometimes is at stake by what they're going through and the church has to say. There's yeah. nothing there to it's address a, it. It's a big vacuum. I wasn't really looking for it too much other than trying to find my mentor mm-hmm. because it, did, it didn't even strike me as a possibility. Mm-hmm. That's how far away it is. I'm seeing it change now, mm-hmm. and you all have really opened my eyes to mm-hmm. what's happening, and I pray that God is making a difference and that this is starting to happen because it's the biggest mission field there is. It's it's a mission field where literally everybody involves mm-hmm. is involved in it. So so the the push is to begin to to help people see that I mean the irony of this is is that is that the very healthy environment that you're talking about corporations need to function particularly relationally within their teams and between groups that work within organizations to connect and understand how they function vis-a-vis one another is not very different than the demands a church has to create the community that it functions with and in. Yes, and in fact, um, not to be negative, but I have seen uh, many churches that need this more than a lot of businesses. Hmm. And I've seen the star system in churches. I've seen poor, uh, some really disastrous situations I've been exposed to, and even to the point where there's workaholics in in really hurting themselves and their family. Mm-hmm. So You're talking about in the church. Within the church. Yeah. Now, the other model, of course, the one that we're trying to talk about and get people to kind of uh, grasp, both uh, really on the both on the business side and the pastoral side, it is a community where pastors become sensitive to the business person in the life that they lead, mm-hmm. and business people engage with pastors to help them understand the life that they lead as well, yes. so that there can be some some spiritual and uh, and uh, form formative input into into the into how the person goes into the workplace, and that didn't make to make this long, but there's no way to go do this, but go there and recognize have the church side recognize this is actually the front lines of of mission for the church that the church doesn't need to create its own evangelistic organization and and program that God's already put that program in place by where He has people scattered in and throughout the marketplace in the business world. Absolutely. My pastor uh, has approached me about doing just this, uh, very open-minded. I think uh, it, it starts with leadership like everything else, and that's the pastor realizing this is needed. Uh, he's not touching the very nerves that are out there and on people's minds and where they're hurt as they sit in that pew on Sunday, just exhausted people, and they're going back Monday to do it again. And you made me think of something. Uh, When I was a younger man, I literally had my life figured out this way. I had my church silo 
or, or circle. Mm-hmm. I had my family next, mm-hmm. and then I had my business next, and then I had my physical fitness circle, mm-hmm. which, by the way, I didn't go in much. <laughs> <laughs> and, and God told me one time, I'll never forget it, the most amazing thing, there's only one circle, Dave, mm-hmm. only one circle. And this was like 10 years ago or more. Mm-hmm. And I realized it's all the same. Mm-hmm. It's all the same. I saw my Jewish brethren having one circle, mm-hmm. yet I had four. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And so I learned not to uh, silo those, but to segregate. I mean, to, to bring all those together, and it, it made a big difference in how I looked at the church as well as my business. But there's very few in, in the in the church today that see it that way. I don't think. Mm-hmm. And of course, the effect of that is that when we when we talk about God stuff when we're in church and talk about God stuff when we're with our family and we talk about uh, maybe um, thinking about spiritually how we take care of our body, um, you know, because it is, you know, the temple of the Holy Spirit, we need to care for it, those kinds of things. But then we don't say anything in the workplace that's like a black hole that exists in life and you obviously you don't have any – and you actually – affirm something the church tries to deny, which is that there isn't a secular sacred divide, that God belongs in every space and in every activity, and yet we somehow manage to, to create this, this silo that actually also at the same time, um, how can I say this, almost siphons off the spiritual energy that happens in the other places because I'm spending so much time and energy in this one, one space. Yeah. Yeah, totally agree. You know, when I was starting my two-year circling the globe and coaching the other areas of Invesco, I remember thinking, wow, you know, this is one time I can really tell the story and, and the role God played in it because he did, number one. Number two, I'm leaving anyway, and mm-hmm. they needed the, the materials that we developed. The other thing I remember fearing a, a little bit, and would this get me off this project, was talking about life balance, mm-hmm. you know? I mean, it's it's that's threatening to a lot of companies. Uh, I can guarantee you, Wall Street, J.P. Morgan doesn't want to hear their leaders talking about life balance. Mm-hmm. The church needs that too, by the way. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so you have a very hostile environment out there now. Mm-hmm. But we got away with it, um, and I, I think maybe you've talked to me about millennials and how they need to understand a little bit more than we did. Mm-hmm. So maybe that is uh, maybe there is something happening there. Interesting. So um, so uh, so you're watching this space kind of open up. Tell tell us what you feel like you're learning. I haven't asked you this question before either. Tell us what you feel like you're learning here in this last. I guess we've been talking to each other now for a little over a year. Um, uh, tell me what you're learning in, in this space now, and what you're seeing that you, because it has you excited too. So, yeah. so let's talk about that a little bit. Well, uh, first of all, I'm just, uh, you know, we did two years of traveling, so th- we're just out of that, and so I'm just thrilled to learn that there really is this thing called faith and work, and it has just changed my world hmm. because. It's it's really sort of verifying, and uh, and you know, what word am I looking for here? Making okay the fact that I have been speaking uh, a lot to this into the space, yeah, into this space, and so it's encouraged me, and um, it's changed my message a little bit, and I'm seeing that there, and it's encouraging for me to hear you and and uh, Bill Hendricks talk about you really see something happening here, so I'm starting to really enjoy hearing that, and all of a sudden here come these phone calls. A pastor of another church asking me to have lunch because they have a program going around this topic, mm-hmm. and so it's woke. It's, wo- it's woken me up to this is really happening, and how he's done this so many times in my career. How I have prepared you without you even knowing it to to fit into this space. Mm-hmm. So I'm just learning a lot. I'm new at it, and I'm learning how uh, important it is. It makes sense because it's the mission field right here. Uh, it's not you don't have to go overseas, although both are good. Yeah, and of course we we haven't unveiled this yet, but we we're, we're working on um, uh, kind of working together to to speak into this space with 
either Christian groups or corporations about this kind of healthy climate that you can produce. Um, and uh, you know, one of the things that we're we're working towards, in fact, it's our next meeting, is to get our terminology to where we we may be talking about the same thing, but we use different terms to talk about it. But we're actually talking about the same thing in the same dynamics. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of translation work that has to go on uh, yes, be, be yes. from the you know because I talk I talk theology speak and you speak business speak and so yeah. Yeah. you know that we need a UN translator in there somewhere <laughs> to help us help us work yeah, it out yeah. but it it it's been interesting to to sense in these conversations as we talk about these values that we're talking about how. Uh, we really are saying the same fundamental things to people about how teams work, how do you build a sense of family in your organizations, how do you how do you get your ministry teams and the church working one way, how do you get your your corporate groups uh, who are tasked with certain responsibilities to work in the in the amount of similarity that that involves is almost almost stunning. I agree with you. There is a lot of just translation. Because when I listen to you all talk, I don't understand some of the words. It's kind of, but then when I ask questions, I realize, wow, yeah, that's what I'm saying too. It is very similar. People are people, mm-hmm. and we're all sinners. Mm-hmm. And the folks in the church are no different than the folks in the business place. We're all sinners, and we all need to um, look to God to to give us the rules to play by the most effective rules. Talk talk a little bit about. Um about the challenge that a corporation has, particularly in holding on to young people. This is something that uh, you and I and Steve Ramsour and Bill have been talking about a lot. Talk about that dimension of why this is important. To, why, why do a corporation care about these, these kinds of questions? Well, um, basically the baby boomers, as you know, are finishing their careers and the millennials are coming up, and uh, they are driven by different factors. And it really is more around. I mean, they're just so different, and I'm just loving watching it. Mm-hmm. But they're so much more technical, and they're onto all the uh, the the iPhones and all the things they use their technology, and they want purpose and meaning in what they're doing. They don't want to just join the org chart, as I heard somebody say here, and follow our path. They want they want to know why. Mm-hmm. And so we have to be different. Uh, I'm seeing Steve's company really address that. Some others aren't. And so I think it's brilliant that they are because they're going to be the meat and potatoes of the next generation of business people, you know, here in the U.S. So we have to pay attention to who our new uh, most valuable asset is. By far, it's our folks. It's our people and um, how to relate to them. And part of what you've been – were able to, to generate at Invesco was this ability to keep people around and – uh, and buy into what was going on there. And one of the challenges that corporations are finding with millennials is they come, but if you don't give them something more than a slot to fit into, they go. Forget it. It won't work. And it, it's hard to hold on to young folks anyway in the in the middle to bottom ranks of your firm mm-hmm. because they need room to move, and mm-hmm. sometimes our stability fought against that. There was nowhere to go, mm-hmm. so we knew we were going to lose some people. But the way we held on to people was never the money. Every now and then that became a factor, and we had circles where we said, we're just not losing that person, mm-hmm. and we, we would take care of that. But for the most part, it was the culture, and culture is too easy a, a, a term. Culture is formed by great by a great platform, which is the health, which are the health issues, mm-hmm. and that's what make people want to be with you. They feel loved, and they feel like they can really um, work in teams and and have that kind of fellowship because we are meant for the, for togetherness. Mm-hmm. Period. Paragraph. We are. There's very few people that aren't. So when you get, it's a very powerful and affirming thing when you get people working in the same direction for the same goals, sharing a care for one another, not just about performing a task, but having a sense of, in the midst of it all, I'm getting to know you better, I'm getting to appreciate who you are as a person, and and, and bringing those values into the workplace become a way of really, it's, it's odd in some ways, you're cementing both the tasks that you are trying to perform, but you're also cementing, um, cementing a people at a personal level that, that, that is satisfying to them as people. 
That's exactly right. Um, to oversimplify a business, mm-hmm. you, you've got great execution capabilities or you don't get a ticket to the dance. Mm-hmm. You have great operational capabilities or you don't get a ticket. And neither of those matter if you don't have great uh, prospect engagement, client engagement techniques, okay, both mm-hmm. prospects and existing clients. All that, a lot of folks get right, not as much in the, <laughs> mm-hmm. in the engagement piece, but they get it right. What they don't have, what makes them enduring – that's why I talk about building enduring businesses mm-hmm. is they don't have that solid foundation, which is the people side of the equation that you just referenced. Mm-hmm. They miss that. And the reason big companies miss it all the time is because they're run by ex-CFOs that are now CEOs. And really, if, it, if they can't measure it, it doesn't matter. And that's the way that business has been run for years and years. And this is a hard thing to measure. In, in another thing, it's just too simple, mm-hmm. and so they ignore it. Hmm. Southwest Airlines didn't ignore it, mm-hmm. okay, but they have great accountants too. So that makes the big difference, in my opinion, and it's probably the single biggest factor today that most big companies could grasp onto to improve themselves. Interesting. So we're, we're running out of time here, so, and I really appreciate you uh, taking the time with us to kind of walk us through what this is like, and for those who are in ministry to kind of get a glimpse of the issues and the in the tensions of what it is to work in the workplace, but then on the other hand, to have us see and appreciate the similarities of what it means to build community to think about how community does get shaped and formed, and in the midst of doing that, to think about the way in which we relationally engage with people that give them value and affirmation so that they're willing to hang in there with us. So, David, I really do appreciate you taking the time to come by and talk with us about this. Very flattered to be here. Thank you so much. And we uh, hope you've enjoyed your time with us here on the table, and we hope to see you again soon. And our hope is is that this has been a, a, a beneficial conversation for you to reflect on. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. For more podcasts like this one, visit dts.edu slash the table. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well.